Hi everyone, welcome back to the Vehicle Setup Bootcamp series. This is the second episode in the series and today we'll cover the fundamentals of a very important topic in race engineering and that is aerodynamics. In the racing world, tuning aero isn't always an option, especially in the case of junior racing series. However, the analysis and inherent design of race cars depends on aero and talking about aero performance is ubiquitous in the world of motorsports. As compared to the previous video, this one will have more on-screen game footage of the effects of aero tuning. But just like before, there are a few topics to cover for everyone's benefit. So the topics we'll cover in this episode will include an overview of aerodynamic forces which act on a vehicle, followed by their effects on top speed. We'll then look at ways in which the balance of aerodynamic forces can be biased to either the front or the rear of the vehicle. Finally, we'll observe the effects of these setups in two different examples. So, when we have a look at the vehicle setup procedure as shown in the previous video, you can see where aero setup lies in the sequence. The reason I've skipped the base mechanical balance and stiffness setups is because it's generally better to leave these as the default setup in the beginning when using sim racing platforms. In real life, teams will similarly have a recommended base setup to start with. We'll also have a small introduction to vehicle ride height and its implications on aerodynamic performance. So, let's start off with some basic fluid dynamics. We'll take a plate for this example. Let's assume it moves through air with a velocity v. This movement results in a relative movement of air backwards onto the plate from the frame of reference of the plate. This generates two forces, namely downforce and drag. Now let's try visualizing this effect. So here we have a group of air particles all starting in a single vertical line. These particles start moving towards the plate. At the first point of contact with the plate, we see the bottommost particle gets deflected downwards as it hits the edge of the plate. The other particles continue traveling towards the plate and sequentially rebound off the plate into one another, effectively deflecting the entire system. This continuously happens through the fluid continuum while the plate continues to move. The bottom line is, when an object moves through a fluid, the fluid is considered to move relative to the object, and these effects are seen. Since the air particles on average hit the surface with a velocity v, a certain amount of momentum is transferred to the plate, or in other terms, the plate experiences an applied force on its surface. This in turn generates a reaction force, which can be resolved vertically and horizontally to give the downforce and drag respectively. This form of visualization is based on Newton's third law and is generally quite intuitive in understanding how aerodynamic forces are generated. The other way to understand how the force is generated is through Bernoulli's principle. In essence, the faster the air moves, the lower its static pressure becomes. When there's a difference in pressure, a force is generated from the high pressure side to the low pressure side. This method of visualization is useful in correlating the speed of air at different points of a car and its corresponding static pressure value. So, now taking the plate into consideration, we have a graph showing how downforce varies with respect to the angle of the plate and in extension the wing in the case of a car, with respect to the direction of flow. This is called the angle of attack. Beyond a certain angle of attack, the flow starts to stall due to development of turbulent air. This causes a sudden drop in downforce and the aerodynamic efficiency. An airfoil is essentially a more efficient form of a plate and it develops more downforce and less drag for the same given angle of attack. The physics of this fluid flow is complex and cannot be covered in this video. Perhaps this topic can be covered in another video series after the vehicle setup boot camp is over. Aerodynamic force is proportional to the square of velocity. This means that when the speed is doubled, the force quadruples and so on. This holds true for both downforce and drag. The issue with this is that at a certain velocity, the drag force becomes equal to all the force pushing the vehicle forward. And this means that the engine cannot overcome this drag force. The velocity stagnates and this is called the terminal velocity of a car. This is undesirable in race cars, but unfortunately, drag and downforce go hand in hand and the generation of one always brings out the generation of the other. So, it's not advisable to have high downforce setups for tracks with long straights. However, this assumption is not always true and we'll soon see why. The aerodynamic forces acting on a vehicle can essentially be replaced by two resolved forces acting at the center of pressure. In a race car, there are usually four separate devices having major influence on the aerodynamic performance. These are the front wing, the chassis, the diffuser and underbody, and finally the rear wing. When we observe the flow of air around the car, we see that there's a sudden surge in velocity causing a drop in pressure underneath the front wing. This is because air gets accelerated through the small gap, which basically acts as a small channel, and this is called the ground effect. 
The entire underside of the vehicle also relies on ground effect, causing the entire car to get pressed downwards. The rear of the vehicle usually has a diffuser which gradually releases air out behind the vehicle. But since it is an expansion chamber after all, air rapidly flows out causing a surge in velocity. The region vertically above the diffuser and behind the rear wing can tend to become turbulent with slightly higher pressure values at high speeds. This can potentially compromise the performance of the rear wing and this is why the rear wing tends to generate a lot of drag. A point to note is that the rear wing gets a lot of turbulent air as the air that hits it is basically air that has been washed out by the front of the vehicle. The rear wing is also placed much higher up and therefore generates bigger moments above the contact patch. As a bottom line, the front wing is a good device for generating downforce and the rear wing is a good device for optimizing aero balance, although in essence, both devices play roles in both processes. Here we're running a terminal velocity test for a high downforce setup and a low downforce setup for a high-end formula car around Daytona. So as you can see from the terminal velocities, you see that the low downforce setup is about 17 kph faster than the high downforce setup. So it's a big difference. Um, now we'll run the same test for a front bias configuration with a high front wing angle and a rear bias configuration with a high rear wing angle to see the effect of drag for both wings separately. And here we can see that the front wing setup is able to hit a speed that's 10 kph faster than the rear wing. So that shows the amount of drag the rear wing brings as compared to the front wing. Let's assume we have a car with 50-50 weight distribution. This is mechanically neutral, so both tires gain their slip angles at the same rate through a corner. In a neutral steering car, the cornering stiffnesses of the tires are the same as we've seen in the previous video. In such a setup, the aerodynamic load distribution or the aerodynamic balance is 50% front biased or basically it's neutral. This means that both tires reach their peak values at the same time. In an understeering car, the aero balance is rear biased. This means that the rear tire stays in its linear range longer than the front, causing the car to be pushed outwards. In an oversteering car, the front tire reaches its peak later than the rear, causing the positive yaw rate of the car to increase and potentially results in a spin. We can see this in the upcoming video. So now I'm doing a test with an RS01 race car around the short Silverstone circuit. Um, and this is for a neutral steering, understeering and an oversteering car. Uh, and I'm going to show you all three at the same time and we can compare the different corners and different lines that each setup takes. So we start off on the main straight and at the first corner you can immediately see that the oversteering setup is already pointing way, way too much towards the inside while the understeering setup is already deviating outwards. And then um, you also see that the oversteering setup is very difficult to control in this case. Um, so I'm running very low rear wing angles in the oversteer setup. Uh, this corner is quite straightforward, pretty similar in all three cases. It's just, you can see the oversteering setup behaving very unstably. Uh, and right now the neutral setup is ahead of both of the other setups. This corner is quite straightforward, but you can very evidently see that the neutral setup is performing well on this track. Uh, and then this is a, a fast right immediately after that left. And at this point, you can already see that the vehicle is heading outwards in the case of understeer and oversteer seems to be well set on path. And that's a lap around the short circuit in Silverstone. And it's obvious that the neutral setup is faster than the other two with oversteer being the slowest. Before concluding, there is one more topic that needs to be covered to gear you up for the next video. The pitch angle or the values for the front and rear ride heights of the vehicle are very important as the performance of the front wing and underbody will vary depending on them. The amount by which the car pitches is determined by the spring stiffness. The relation between the front ride height, rear ride height and the downforce or drag on the vehicle is called the aero map. It's a three dimensional graph. Let's see how this graph varies for a car that enters and exits a corner. Firstly, the car is at a very high speed and maximum downforce is acting on the vehicle, pressing it down. As the driver approaches a corner, the brakes are pressed and inertia load transfers to the front of the car, pitching the front downwards. As the driver slowly eases off the brakes, the front ride height increases. The rear ride height also increases and at the apex of the corner, the ride heights are quite high. 
observed that the front and rear ride heights are higher than in the first step due to lower amounts of downforce pressing the car down. As the vehicle exits the corner, the driver increases the throttle input and the rear ride height drops a little while the front ride height also drops a bit. This is because the front wing starts getting more downforce and the entire vehicle ultimately gets pressed down. Let's observe this once again. The car is initially maxed out at the end of the straight, fully pressed down. The driver slams on the brakes and the front of the car dips. The brake input eases off and the vehicle being slower than before slowly rises up. At the apex, the car is neutral and at its highest ride height. When the car accelerates out of the corner, weight is transferred backwards and the car starts getting pressed down again until it finally maxes out once again. Now, when we see the downforce distribution for the front and the rear, we can understand the force values at different points and we will know whether a car is either going to be front or rear biased at different points in the corner. In sim racing games, you might not have access to this information as it is confidential. Don't worry, the plot that I've used here is completely random but within logical limits. So why did I explain this if it isn't useful for sim racing itself? Well, it's because your car will tend to behave differently in different parts of a corner and understanding this visually will make your understanding more intuitive while driving and while further setting up your mechanical balance for the car. So now we'll see the performance of an LMP1 car around Watkins Glen with an understeer, oversteer and neutral setup. This is also a good idea for you to see how I would gauge my own lap time, my own driving style and how you could replicate it for your own. Um, so we're approaching the first corner and here you can already see the amount of steering correction in oversteer while the understeering car just continues to plow through the corner. Uh, the understeering car also has a lot of drag by the looks of it because it's running way behind the others. Uh, the good thing about Watkins Glen is it's a track with multiple straights and a lot of high speed, medium speed flowing corners. It's a very good testing ground for the aerodynamics of your car. So coming to this fast chicane, neutral steer goes in pretty well. Uh, and you can see the understeering car seems to just struggle and it just overshoots the chicane while it goes to the exit of the chicane. Um, now, we're, now we're entering the, the inner layout of the track. So neutral steer is ahead. Oversteer, again, you have a lot of steering corrections and understeer is just at full lock, as you can see. This corner is quite straightforward. All three cars seem to be working at the same, in the same range with the same behavior. Um, getting to this section, you can again see understeer just plowing on ahead, almost going off the track over there. Uh, now we're almost about to round up the lap. This corner is quite slow, so all the setups seem to work nearly the same. The upcoming corner is a high speed left, and you can again see corrections in the oversteer setup while the neutral steer and understeer seem to go through that fairly easily. And then we go through the final turn and wrap up a lap in Watkins Glen. Um, so yeah, this is a good, good way to analyze your own driving style so that you'll understand what your base setup is and where you need to work from from there. For example, for me, by the looks of it, I like to go with a neutral steering, slightly oversteering setup, and I start tuning my setups from that point. So to put all of this in a nutshell, we have a graph that shows the amount of front wing influence on the Y axis and the amount of rear wing influence on the X axis. A more green box has less drag and a more orange box has more drag. If your track has a lot of straight sections, then a setup in this region is preferred. This includes tracks like Monza and super speedways like Daytona and Talladega. On the contrary, if a track is very technical with lots of turns and high speed corners, a setup in this region would be ideal. This includes tracks like Monaco and the Hungara Ring. If the track is well balanced and you prefer oversteer, this region is ideal. If the track is quite technical, but also has a lot of straight sections, this region is ideal. For example, the 24 hour Daytona layout and Mount Panorama. So with this, I'd like to wrap up the aerodynamic segment. In the next episode, we'll spend a bit more time with the aero map to see exactly what spring and ride height tuning individually do to it. We'll also see the effects of ride heights on aero balance and the effect of spring stiffness on the mechanical balance of the car. With that, I'd like to conclude this episode. Once again, thank you very much for your time. I hope this video has been insightful. I'm always open to suggestions as it will help me improve over the course of this series. Well, it looks like we could do with some new tires. It's time to box for a fresh set. Stay safe and thanks for watching. This is Saidat signing off.